Hey everybody, welcome to Love and Reload, a voice of the relocation industry. I am your host, Ben Cross, and I am here with my friend, Sean Luchens, Vice President, Corporate Development and Marketing at Air Inc. Sean, how are you doing today? I'm great. Thanks for having me. Sean, where in the hell are you right now? <laughs> Well, if anybody knows it, they should probably get a prize. I'm in Leonardsville, Pennsylvania. Um, I don't know, 15 miles off the highway or something in the middle of nowhere uh, at a campground. Nice. This is great. So you're at a campground, which is like the dream for so, so many people right now that are watching this right now are either in an office or probably more likely in a, a, a walk-in closet in their house. And their kids are screaming and they're beating each other up in the other room and they're trying to get through a conference call while really actually listening to Love and Reload. And they wish they were in a campground right now. Mm -hmm. So today we're going to talk about the work from anywhere um, trend, we're going to call it. Is it a phase? Is it reality? Is it the future? You know, what's going on? I want to hear your thoughts. If you're watching this right mm -hmm. now, what are your thoughts? And here's a question to get us started. Let us know where you are today, but if you could work from anywhere, where would you work? Throw it in the comments. I want to know if you could work from anywhere, where would you work? Check in, hit that like button. Sean, is this the place you would work forever or would you kind of take an approach where you would just kind of like be more nomadic? Um, I like the nomadic part. I got to be a little bit careful. I've... Um... Uh, I've been without my spouse for five weeks. So if I say this has been really great, um, that, that might not end well for me when I get home pretty soon. But overall, it's been awesome. So I had a bucket list of um, East Coast items, um, the Appalachian Trail in Shenandoah Park, Tale of the Dragon, which is a road in Tennessee, just curvy Tale road. Of the just, dragon? Yeah, if you it's Google crazy. it, it's 11 miles, 318 turns. So if you're a cyclist, motorcyclist, car person, they generally know who they are. Um, so just a bucket list of places on the East Coast that um, over five weeks I, um, I would knock out. And I kind of tied in a um, I've got one daughter in uh, Tuscaloosa, Alabama, and another one in Tampa. And so I kind of tied all of that stuff into a five week kind of jaunt up and down the coast. And I'm on the tail end now. So kind of interesting time to have a call like this. I'm just about five weeks in of, of kind of work, trying to work remote. And other than I think one day off during the week i've taken only the weekend so i've truly kind of worked remote this is so fascinating right now because so many people got the notice over the last few months my brother this happened to his job his boss came and said you know what we're gonna go permanent remote and then his next question my, my brother's question was well does that mean i can work from anywhere his boss took a day came back and said i guess so and then they sold their house and they moved to Tulsa, Oklahoma to be closer to your family. Do you think that this is a phase or is this the future work from anywhere? Yeah, I mean, I think there's obviously roles you need to be in place and organizations to maintain their culture are going to have to figure out how to get people together. Um, there's compliance issues. I probably shouldn't bring that up since I don't know if any of the states I was in, if I'm a revenue generating employee, if I'm causing issues or tax issues since they don't know where we are. Um, I do think, though, that it really opens up a lot of opportunities for companies to get the best talent wherever they are, depending on the role. So prior, you might have a, a limited window in your location. And if you were in a low cost location, you might not be able to get the talent you need. And now that talent's readily available to you. Um, the flip side to that is, um, because I think everyone's talking about that positive, is the war for talent becomes kind of a national thing now, right? You can't just have some proximity to the best talent. Uh, you have to find a way to attract and retain the best talent. So I think I think it is. I think it work remote. I think people are going to have to figure it out. Um, uh, the, the other piece of that for me is uh, I know I, I've lived in um, remote areas generally. And so everyone says that must be so great. I've worked remote for over 15 years. Um, my first question to people is usually like, how many times you go out to eat? Because the town I've lived in for a while has one restaurant. So, you, you know, if you're a, a you know, foodie and you like to go out and do different things, working remote, you kind of have to figure out what works for you. Yeah, it's a great point. I think there's so many things we have to consider here. Let's see who's checking in with us and let's get into all of them. If you've got questions for Sean, we're going to talk about work from anywhere, working remote. You know, the future of that is going to come back to 
you know, to the office environment? Is it going to be a hybrid environment? Is it going to be a full time, you know, remote work environment? What are the implications we have to think about? What are the, the levels of employee where this works for? What types of industries does this impact the most? I've got a ton of things in my mind. And I also want to hear what Sean has learned being on the road for five weeks. No spouse. Tim Quirk's mind is blown. All right, we're going to talk about all that stuff. Uh, Stacy Huff checking in. Super producer Stacy, excited to hear about Sean's work from anywhere experience. Stacy, if you could work from anywhere, where would you work? If you could get a trailer and go down the dragon's tail or whatever trail you want to go down, <laughs> where would you go? Love it. This is fun. Tim Quirk, hello for sunny Western. New York to Sean and Ben should be a great show for sure. Michael Cadden checking in. Hi, Sean. Michael, if you can work from anywhere, where would you? Now, a lot of these people work remote anyway. So what's the difference between working remotely and work from anywhere? Or is there a difference? Yeah, I, I think um, the, the biggest thing is, you know, trying to logistically move from point A to point B, et cetera. I think for me, I've been in, let's see, over five weeks, probably nine or 10 locations, not counting kind of one night places. So really kind of making that travel versus parking somewhere for a couple a couple weeks. And I think just having your systems, uh, I'm gonna sound like a total nerd now, but I'm a four monitor type of person. So, you know, usually my laptop and three monitors with stuff up. And so um, working with a laptop and one monitor has been, you know, one of those kind of interesting issues for me. Um, you know, kind of, so I think okay, it's just- Okay, I'm gonna, let's, let's stop there. Let's get super <laughs> practical for a second. Super yeah. practical. You're a four monitor person. That's that's frankly egregious. But but if you were in most people are two monitors, these these days two monitors super common, right? So yeah. what are things that you can't do on one monitor that you were doing on four? And so I, I couldn't I couldn't break down and go all the way to, to one. I'm on two. So I'm kind of in the oh, you know, nice. I'm on a twelve step program to get to two. Um you, you know, so I think I think it's it's two. Um but I think the difference I've worked from home from 15 years is, is you have systems and you kind of get used to that. Um, and also I think carving out that space at home for me was always critical. I've been in global roles for a long time. And the, the thing I learned early was you have to either blend it and carve out part of the middle of the day or really separate your office. So I jokingly have worked in, in the dungeon for 15 years at home. I like to carve it out the corner of the house. It's away. And then when I leave, I leave. Um, I'm in a pretty small camper. Uh, and so that propensity to kind of just pick stuff up and work or why you do anything else work is 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 here. And that that can be a little bit draining because you're never more than I'm um, never literally more than eight or 10 feet away from work. So let's talk about that camper for a second, because I I've COVID hit and I was looking at these RVs and I'm thinking, man, do I get a fifth wheel? Do I get the RV that you drive? Am I just crazy? Probably see. But I really looked at them. What what are you what are you working with there? Like what kind of a situation? Yeah. Are you in? Is this like a have you had a camper for a long time or is this kind of a new we, thing? Um, we've had campers for a long time, but small. Um, and actually, it's, I guess we're probably still pretty small if you were looking at fifth wheels. So I'm in what's called a little guy max. Um, so it's 21 feet long and that includes the hitch so the inside of it's probably 15 or 16 feet by seven feet so you can imagine 100 square feet um, minus storage wet bath fridge whatever so it's you know there's i think i measured the other day i have somewhere around 26 feet of square feet of floor space maybe you know 24 feet so it's pretty small wow what's the hardest part so like help me understand like what it, what it's like data what's the hardest part of living in a, in a camper for an extended period of time um, well, I'll come back to it over and over again, working remote, um, sir, internet bandwidth. So at home, you're on high speed. So I really, uh, I did try to plan around two things this trip. One, not being too far from the highway, which typically the service is better there, or trying to actually send out and find out where T-Mobile hotspots were, uh, T-Mobile towers to get out in front of that. And the other was, uh, since it was summer in the Southeast, um, having shore power, being able to plug in. So I had air conditioning. Um, I did a couple nights without, but basically internet access is the biggest issue. You know, that's, that's funny. Cause you know, we're going to get to all your questions. See the questions, the comments are coming in, keep the questions and the comments coming in. I want to know what you think, because I, I know we've all flirted with this idea in the past. I know we've all like, yo, you know, it'd be so cool. If let me know what you're thinking out there. I'm going to ask Sean all your questions. Um, you know, 
as a person who just, you know, who started, who started a company within like the last year and then left, you know, big, you know, corporate, you know, with the, with the office and the, you know, all the creature comforts and the, and the printer that works and the network printer and the, and the, and the, and the, the landline, all that, you know, you do when you, when you start working from home, even just working from home was a major adjustment. And the fact that the internet would glitch out on me sometimes, or, you know, the fact that if my computer stopped working, I couldn't just call Steve, like Steve fix it. I'm going to lunch. And then I come back and my laptop works. again. Like there's so many of these kinds of um, hidden productivity sucks, I guess. And, you know, just the stops and yeah. starts and just the things weren't working that you just take for granted, frankly. Um, do you think that this is a real issue that should be considered when we talk about long-term, even remote work? Yeah, I, I think your company's got to buy in. So I think, you know, our company, I think, has, has really bought into work from home. We have another guy in the company that is um, going. So I've been going campground to campground as remote as you can be, you know, from place to place. And he's been going city to city every month, a different city. Um, and so I think from a company culture, your company has to buy in buy into that. And that's from, you know, whether it's your boss or how you handle your, your employees, basically the, you know, get your crap done, um, you know, wherever, whenever type of yeah. mentality. And I, I think employees like that. And then also having an IT department that, um, you know, understands this is what's going on and, and isn't angry when you call and say, Hey, what, you know, what's up with my hotspot? Did I hit my, you know, the spots on my phone where it's going to glitch or can you, to your point, you know, you can't just call someone. So them getting a message while they're, you know, working somewhat remote, having to fix some dudes in a campers, uh, internet access or something, yeah, yeah, having everybody put in. A, yeah. Do they have to be available now like different hours? Because now the idea too is like, okay, if we're working all remotely, are we still working nine to five or whatever that mm -hmm. is? You know, so we're kind of clustered together. So when we send emails that you responded to, so we call IT help desk, you know, IT response, et cetera, et cetera. You know, that that's another thing. Or, or now that we're working these crazier hours, is it like I can send something to somebody and then overnight they might work on it? And and do we get productivity yeah. in off hours that we didn't receive before? And what's the balance like? Yeah, for us, it's, um, you know, we're a global company already. So that infrastructure of getting, you know, help desk tickets or what have you has been super helpful and the, and the core IT team has just has been awesome. You know, if anything, they're like, you know, let us try to fix that so you can be more remote or what have you. So they've they've been, been really great. So I do think that's a key part that maybe until you just brought it up, you know, I overlooked because the culture at Air Inc is kind of, you know, work anywhere, get it done, um, show up for the meetings, obviously, you know, when the groups are online, but just yeah. get your work done. So this is great. Uh, great discussion here. We got comments and questions coming in. Vinny Valverge. What's up from sunny Portland, Oregon? Vinny works remote. I bet most people that are watching this work remotely now. And I want to talk about, you know, knowledge workers, you know, blue collar versus white collar and, and things like that. Tim Quirk's got a question. Keep these questions coming. I want to hear your questions are always better than mine. Tim says, if all are remote, is company culture a thing? I, I mean, I'm happy to. So I, it's interesting. We're having worked 15 years uh, and being remote 15 years ago, you, you know, when I got to Eric, I was kind of the weirdo that was going to work remote, um, especially at a, at a senior level. And I and think they decided they liked those weirdos and they started hiring a bunch of weirdos. Well, or, the, or they thought it was better that I was remote. That, that could also be one of the answers that happened. <laughs> um, good moderation kind of. Guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's good. Send him back. Um, <laughs> But to Tim's question, I think you have to work at it. So that culture and working with people and, you know, do you get on the phone call five minutes early? You know, are you proactive about setting up a call? Because you don't, you know, if I can't remember if Tim's the one, someone's in Portland. So, you know, I'm not going to run into him at the, at the grabbing a coffee. That's just not going to happen. So you've got to have, you know, probably at least half of the people statistically who are going to reach out and say, hey, Ben, you know, let's have coffee. Um, you, you know, every other Tuesday morning for a half an hour and we don't have a work docket, you know, we might wander into work, but we're just going to check out what's going on. Um, you, you know, so that you can figure out what, what are people really about? You get to know people, you build a bond, you understand what's going on. You know, people can, you know, I can figure out, Ben, how many pairs of cufflinks do you have? You know, questions that are really important less when you're starting to build. Every time I go to the dry cleaner, I always yeah. to take them out and then like <laughs> some will get returned, some don't. Um, so, so I, okay. Question for you and question for the audience here. Audience question. What tools, cause now we're, we've all been working remotely at some point over the last year and a half. What tools have you been using in your remote work that have given you that sense of community 
connectivity, collaboration. You know, for me, one of the things that we're doing now at Glomo is we're all convening in a, in a virtual office called, you know, Wonder, wonder.me. And, and so we're coming together in this room with our little avatars and we're in different offices. I have an office, Jenna has an office, you know, we have offices. And if I want to go like pop in on Jenna, I'd be like, you know, and her screen's blacked out and her camera, her, her mic's muted, but I'm like, Hey, you know, Jenna, you there? And she, she might be there. Or she might not be there. You know, if she's there. She'll turn on her camera. Hey, what's going on? What you need? And I'm talk a little bit, you know, and it kind of lowers the barrier. So it's not like let's schedule a zoom that might be 30 minutes and only two minutes of time or a phone call or some people feel is kind of obtrusive. I'd love to hear like technologically speaking, are there tools that you use now or that you've seen use well, that kind of create that connectivity and that collaborative environment. So we, we use teams in SharePoint to share docs teams, I think can be used a number of different ways. Right. So for me, it, it is just, you know, instead of sending someone an email, do you use a teams at times? Eric has gone to every couple of weeks. We, we have town halls. So each region kinds of gets together. So, you know, almost like you used to gather in the, you know, the lunchroom or whatever, and everyone chats about things and ask is able to ask questions of senior leadership, et cetera. And then each region and team has those as well. So I think that's gone well, but I think the biggest thing is just trying to, um, you know, really trying to make sure you're connecting with people versus the, you know, and, and I think, again, it's just a conscious effort at times. I could send Ben an email um, and just ask him a question, get an answer, but hey, you know, hey, are you there? You know, type of thing, almost like if you're in the cube where you'd raise your hand up, or maybe I'm dating myself, you know, you're on the other side no, of me. And you, cubes. There's still cubes right there. See, yeah, there's so, so you, you know, you, you prairie see. dog up in the cube. So you got a prairie dog a different way, right? You can't prairie dog over and see if you're on the phone. Are you on the phone type of thing? Um, you've kind of got a prairie dog in teams and say, are you there? Y you know, um, hey, I got a question for you. Get on the phone and chat. And I think that's all part of that that culture thing. I like this. I'll have to check out wonder.me. Oh, dude, check out wonder. Wonder sick. I'd love to. Some people are living. They're living in Slack nowadays. Some yeah. People are just living in Slack. Uh, Richard says Zoom and StreamYard. That tool you described reminds me a little of an app called Shindig. All good fun. Yeah. Yeah, super interesting. Yeah, my, my uh, concern as a leader that we have a limited number of tools because if, if one group uses Slack and another uses Team and another uses Shindig, then you, you end up siloing. And I so so I've tried to be with our leadership team, make sure that we've got, you know, the support. And I think it helps our IT team, you know, speaking of them again, or, you know, the team that's supporting something like Microsoft Teams, they only have one, one tool, so they can be really good at that tool. Um, and they're always teaching us new things. You know, you're like, gosh, I wish Teams would do that. And then they send me a note and be like, Sean, like, why don't you look at the help button? It does do that. Um, F1, Sean, yeah, it's a new thing yeah. called F1. <laughs> yeah. No, that's awesome. Kevin Ryan, chime in, elevating Teams works well. My company, LDI, is both collaboration elevate kevin what's elevate i don't know what that is francine's loving this prairie dog differently huh. that is a great point Should i might I be dating myself whole... i might be showing my age with the prairie dog term so no but i mean like that's like a whole like that, that's like a whole remote work kind of mantra like you know you just gotta you just gotta prairie dog differently you know we're hmm. still collaborating debbie at nei we use video phones and have for several years and it really helps to stay connected with coworkers, I've worked remote for 16 years. So Debbie's worked remote pretty much the same amount of time you've worked remote. Have you noticed this whole video thing? What do you think about this whole video phenomenon? Right <laughs> so it's interesting as a, um, I guess a manager, or I, I manage several different things, I guess at Air Inc. The one thing I don't like about all the video, I think it's great because you have eye contact and you work and you're doing these meetings is I used to um, stalk or uh, you know, sit in on several calls where you kind of want to pay attention, but you don't have to because you're you're just kind of trying to stay in the know. And you know, if if you do that and you're on video, you look like a dork, right? Because they can tell you are multitasking over on the side and not paying attention. Yeah, you're so disengaged, right? Yeah, like, come on, yeah, come on, Sean. Like, can you just get off your phone? Yeah. Like, be here now, right? Like, yeah, and I really am. And honestly, you know, five years ago, I would have been disengaged on purpose. I would have waited and lift if something came up that was interesting or I needed to be involved with. I would be there. So I think that efficiency um, and trying to figure out when you use video, when you don't. I think I've struggled with, you know, if Debbie's worked remote and uses video, she'll probably pop on video. But there's always that weird thing where you get on Teams with somebody and they they won't get on video and you're on video and you're like, you know, of course, in my mind, I'm like, 
where are you that you don't want to show that you are? Because literally, I'm not at an office. Um, where where don't you want to tell me you are? Yeah, what could be worse than the dungeon in Vermont? You know, that, that's right, in the dead of winter. So what pool, what poolside are you at? Right? Yeah. And if they are poolside, is that a problem? Yeah, I don't think so anymore. I think it's becoming more accepted or, you know, hey, well done, Ben. That's a cool yeah. pool. Like, where right. are you? Where are right. you? How's the what internet you access? You know, See, can me, I park I'm a like, camper? Yeah, me, I'm like, if I'm at a resort or something, I'm turning my screen around to show you that I'm at a resort. <laughs> and I'm going, you know, I'm going to be on this call, but I just want you to let you know I'm over here after this call. I'm in that pool right there. Yeah. Well, I think it changes the um, the questions you ask because you're like, Ben, where are you? And then you'll tell them. And then instead of, you know, someone being angry, they'll be like, how many bars do you have? Who's your provider? Like, you know, it'll be more that because you're like, all right, I can go there. That's my provider. I love it. Is there is there almost like, um, well, we're talking about video for a second because I'm kind of obsessed with like, you know, the, the backdrops. And ever since Peggy, Peggy Smith told me about Room Raider. And I didn't know what she was talking about. She's talking about Room Raider. So if y'all don't know, follow Room Raider on Twitter. Um, and they basically go in and they rate your backdrop, right? Because we're all doing Zoom life, right? So they rate your backdrop. Like, oh, plant, nice job. Got good depth. Got some art. Move the chords. You know, you're probably right. Nine, nine out of ten, right? And and so it's, it's just a great follow. That and, uh, and Zillow Gone Wild are great follows. Um, so, but is there, there almost becomes like a little bit of, um, What's the word? Elitism, perhaps, or a little bit of flossing starts to happen when you're on the uh, when you're on the when you're on the Zoom and you got the cool backdrop or something like me. I'm over here. I'm like, yeah, see, there's people in the background. I'm like, look at me, how cool I am. Well, this one's not as cool. I had a cool moment. I was out at a uh, a campground and went out to kind of a a peak looking over a valley and people are like, where'd you get the backdrop? And I'm like, no, that's it. They're like, no. I'm like, well, like, I'm not going to jump off and show you, but it's it's where I am. No. <laughs> I'm not, I'm yeah. not gonna, uh, let's see we got people checking in here this is awesome Heidi says Airbnb virtual experiences can be helpful for remote team bonding hmm. are we gonna start seeing more of these I'm going to one I'm going to uh I'm going to to London in two weeks for a team get together what do they call these offsite strategy offsites become on sites now yeah, I think it's going to be interesting from a budget standpoint. You know, I think people downsize their offices or people remote and will they take the money as savings or will they, I, I hope companies take some of that and allocate that to teams getting together. There still isn't for me, the tactical, practical, you know, what's one plus one type of email that can be done in e email, you know, and mm -hmm. virtually, but that whole brainstorming, what are we going to do strategically? Let's kind of be creative together. I think there's, I still think there's better flow in person. Uh, and so will teams allocate some of that, that rent, you know, that some of that space and allocate those dollars to getting people together one way or another to the, to the point that someone had earlier about culture, you know, one night of hanging out together can be, you know, can go a long ways to company culture. Yeah, I really can. Yeah, it would be interesting to see how, how companies creatively reinvest those savings on real estate. Um, Richard saying it sounds like green screens will totally change to be palm trees from the office now. It'll be office green screen from the beach, an office background at the beach. That's funny. Uh, Vinny says, "As I okay, here's a question for you, Sean. Put your thinking cap on. Yeah. As I recently started working remotely full time and managing a team, what is one or a few recommendations to provide for us newbies?" So Vinny's a new remote leader. Yeah, I, I still think, you know, not not dying, you know, not diving into email for everything uh, and, and catching up in person. And I still think having these kind of unstructured, you know, I know with uh, with my marketing team in particular, we'll we'll sometimes schedule meetings. And um, maybe I shouldn't say this publicly because, you know, my boss might hear me, but we'll we'll schedule 30 minutes and not talk about work. You know, um, and I think that, to be honest, that helps a lot. You talk, you get to know each other, you know you know, I'm working with you, Ben, we, we start to work with each other that way when the meeting becomes tenuous, you know, because we have a difference in opinion on something, you know, I don't go away going, you know, I never want to talk to Ben again. We just had a difference of opinion. Um, I know so he's, a, I, I think he's a good guy. So I think that relationship helps you yeah. to have better meetings where you can discuss and work through difference of opinion. That's so smart. I remember earlier, you know, early in my career, I had a problem because I had a large team, of like 25 people, and I would only talk to people when there was a problem. And so they started yeah. avoiding me. They started, you know, there's like this, you know, this weird dynamic. And then, and they basically hated me because all they heard was negativity from me. Right. 
And so I could see how it would get really dark, really easy if you were not even face to face. And now you, you got to go out of your way to communicate with somebody. I, I can see it being. Yeah. So, I mean, what's that, that ratio? I mean, you almost need to be like two thirds positive or more. Yeah. And I think having regularly scheduled meetings help too. One is just a cadence, you know, for getting people meetings done, you know, the old days and again, date myself, you know, if I had a project due for you, Ben, I knew I'd have to get that done because I'm going to see you in the hallway. Um, at some point you're going to be like, where the hell is your work, Sean? Um, and now I think if you know you have a biweekly or weekly meeting and there's a check-in, it's going to come up. So I think it helps keep some cadence. And it also, I think just makes it so that, you know, to your point, oh my God, Ben scheduled a meeting with me. This can't be good. It's just, been scheduled a meeting with me, like whatever. I don't know if we're going to talk about work or a project or whatever it is. Yeah, I like that idea. And, and I like that. Yeah, I think you're right. You know, whenever you know you have to show up to a meeting with a piece of work to then present to the group, that deadline becomes a lot firmer in your mind. So then how do you schedule more meetings in order to keep those deadlines and things moving along? Maybe shorter meetings, maybe 10 minute yeah. meetings. Versus yeah, I, I think that's actually an interesting, that's an interesting thing. I think people default to what is, uh, I know Outlook defaults to one hour meeting. Um, and so, you know, I, I think working remote, I, you know, the other thing I'll do, and I know some people at work know I do this, is I'll, I'll block a couple hours sometimes just to get things done. Because if you leave your calendar open, people will over meeting you um, to, to hang out or see you. And so, you know, I've got to get this, I've got to get this document out, you, you know, for love and relo. Um, before Jenna sends me a nasty gram. So, um, yeah, yeah, job, before I get that. So there's, so then you send, so, you know, you schedule 30 minutes, um, you know, to get that done. So I think just managing your calendar to make sure that you have, have time for all that. For sure. Super, super, super good uh, advice there. Let's see here. Um, Kathy's saying we finally had a company party outside on the water and it was nice to see each other in person. Let's see here. What else we've got here? So we have 100% of living abroad on the call. That's good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hi, Ben and Sean. If I could work anywhere, it would be by a beach. That's awesome. To me, Let's that's one that. of the cool questions to ask people. I, I, um, I hate the beach. I'm so not a beach guy. I'm a pretty why, avid. Why do, you, why do you hate the beach? We should do a top five. Top five reasons the beach is overrated. Yeah, I, I'm I'm pretty active, and I don't know if you know, most most beaches don't have a lot of shade, and and I just can't sit and read on the water, and there's people, and and actually I don't know if you know, there's a lot of beaches that have sand, it gets in your toe, like it gets everywhere. I just you know, it's not my, but to me it's kind of interesting because if everyone went to the beach, then no one would be in the mountains. If everyone went to the mountains, then I'd be complaining that there were too many people up in the mountains. So everyone's got their own thing. And um, I'm, I'm very curious when people say, no, I want to work in the city, but remote. I want to work by a beach. I want to work cold weather, hot weather. It's, it's really interesting to me where all these people, when, to your question, if you could work anywhere, where would you work? All right. So here's the thing. Let's, let's think about this for a second because the beach, the beach is a popular one. I've tried to work on the beach before. Some issues with the beach. It's too hot, which is actually a problem. If it's not a problem for you, it's a problem for your technology. Technology needs to stay cool. Your computer's going to overheat at the beach. Sand will also not only get in your toes and other places, but it'll also get in your keyboard. So you got to be careful with that as well. Scratch your phone too. Um, and when you're trying to do those Zoom calls and it's like super bright and you're squinting like this and it's all this and like, yeah, you, you know, you you sweat, you're sweating down, you know, you're sweating and your sunscreen's running and your pina colada's melting and you can't get off the call fast enough. And it's just like, what's going on? Martin checking in. This is great. Huh? Hey, I want to know what your questions are. It's awesome. Milford. Milford yeah, I think the last time I saw Martin speaking of stuff like that, I saw him. We we're having coffee somewhere and it was a hundred and freaking 17 degrees or something stupid so and one of those in the desert yeah, things Arizona. Yeah. yeah yeah like i don't need to go there and work either so not yeah, not in St july no. stacy sounds like she's more of a, a mountainous uh -huh. person she says alaska stacy where in alaska don't not anchorage i went to anchorage i'll tell you why i was disappointed no like the mountains right like cabin by mount mckinley catch some salmon you know, bring it back, hop on the Zoom while you're skinning your salmon. You're just talking to people. <laughs> they can hear it on the grill in the background. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Let's see. Let's see. Richard's saying, I'm from, uh, hi from London. I think I would like to work from a coastal location. Well, Wales. Coastal. Wales. I, I, <laughs> nice. I would do Wales. I would do Wales a bunch. Salty and sandy would suit me fine. So this is the key. You got to think about where would you work from, not where do you want to go vacation, because there is still a, a delineation between your work time and your 
vacation time? Or are we kind of more fluid and there's really not that hard and, and fast eight to five or whatever, where you're, you know, nose to the nose to the keyboard? Uh, you know, is it more of like, a, oh, I got a few hours, a few calls in the morning. I'm going to hit those calls and I'm going to go, you know, get some sun, maybe take a cat nap, play with the kids in the pool, come back in, knock out a couple more calls. I mean, is that, is that, I mean, do you see it going there? Or do, you, do you think? Yeah, I, I think it depends on the role. I So I've had a global role. And so work-life blend for me has been a big, I call it work-life blend. I don't I think others have, you know, and it, it actually took me a couple of years. I was at um, company prior when I had my first global role. And again, pick on my age, but at my age, you know, I started in the days of nine to five. And so I would work then, you know, five or six in the morning till seven or eight with global calls and work the evenings. But then if I didn't work completely eight to five, I would feel dirty um, because I felt like if I took a two or three hour lunch to do something, I'm like cheating. Like I felt guilty, like I should be calling my turning myself into HR. Um, and I kind of learned over the years, you know, you get your stuff done and you do the meetings when you have to do them. I've, I've generally had a rule that if I'm the minority um, on the numbers, I'll do it on their time zone. So if it's APAC, I'll do it my night or super early in Europe, our morning, you know, type of stuff. I don't want them to have to stay off hours if I'm in the minority. Um, and then I just learned to kind of blend that and take time in the middle of the day to go do what I've got to do or want to do, I guess, to be fair. Um, sure. And I think that's the way it's going to go, depending on the role. Um, and I think everyone has to look at it different. Can you carve out three hours in the middle of the day and and not um, and, and be OK with that? Or do you feel like yeah. you're an eight to five person? Like I just got to your point. I got to put my nose down for eight hours and then I'm done. And, uh, and does the work suffer? I mean, that's kind of yeah. the, the real question, too. Right. It's like, you know, uh, we've got someone checking in from the Pyrenees in France. France is far behind with the idea of remote working. Managers simply don't trust their staff when they're at home. Interesting. That's a that's and I don't think that's an age thing. I used to think it was an age thing. I'll again pick on people that are maybe I'm over 50, so I'll just say it that way. That felt I think that's just people do have this trust thing. And I think that's just learning people ask about managing a group. You know, I think being able to trust people and then having really open and honest discussions about are you the type, Ben, that I have to check in with every two days? There's nothing wrong with that. I don't have a problem with that so that you're working along. Or if it's a two-week project, do, are you just going to show up in two weeks? You tell me and let me help you how, you know, help you manage yourself. But I think people have to be honest with that. Because, um, you know, in the old days, everyone would say, are you self-directed? Can you work on your own? Do you need direction? And the, the proper interview answer was, of course I need, I can work completely on my own. I don't need your I'm help. I'm a self-starter. I'm a self-starter because <laughs> you didn't want to answer. And now, you know, when I've interviewed people, it's, you know, hey, seriously, if you tell me you're going to be on your own, I'm going to leave you on your own. So, so if you want to, you know, I'm going to give you a lot of rope. You can choose to make a really cool basket with it or hang yourself. Those are your, you know, you got to figure Those that out. And let me know. Yeah. You got to let me know. And I'm, I'm willing nope. to help you. That's my job as a manager, but I think that's the piece. And I feel bad, you know, people in France, you know, they want to work remote. Um, and what's going to happen in a global market to me, that's interesting because if a U.S. if, if, if a French company doesn't treat their employees well and they want to work remote, potentially that's an opportunity for me to hire a great employee somewhere who's going to think we're great because I'm letting them work remote. Well, and that's the thing, right? So some companies are going to be slow to adopt this and they are going to grab up a lot of great talent that just needs the flexibility. But the converse could be true too, where if you have too many people doing it who aren't the right types of people or the right types of roles or the right types of skills, or, or maybe they're just not self-starters, you know, whatever it is, right? It could, could massively backfire too. You know, you could just not have the collaboration, the innovation, all the other fears, you know, I mean, you know, time, time will tell. I mean, we've been doing it with certain types of people, skill workers, the high skill workers, um, you know, uh, uh, sales people, business development people, you know, no, you know, notoriously or, or, you know, kind of work for more people. Um, but now doing it with other parts of the workforce, I think, you know, the, the, the jury's out a little bit on some of that stuff. Um, I want to talk, though, about global mobility, because, I mean, here we are. And it's kind of the elephant in the room. It's kind of the elephant in the room here. And I want to talk a little bit about global mobility because we're all in the reload, reload biz. Hmm? And of course, the biggest concern on everybody's mind, I think, after like, what's COVID going to do, is <laughs> if everybody were to work from home, if everybody were to work remotely or work from anywhere, will anybody ever need to reload? What is the impact hmm. of work from anywhere, work from home, work remote, 
and relocation. So I think the policies are going to change. I think one of the simple things I've kind of said, I don't, I don't actually come from Relo long term. Um, so I come from comp, Ben, and recruitment. So a little bit of a different perspective over the years. Um, you're, you're already hedging. Sean's already hedging. He's like, listen, no, I don't no. even come from well, Relo. I'm, the I'm reason to, I say that is when you, when you look at the cost of an assignment, right? So either all the business people were really stupid before um, or I don't think it's going to go away. Because at some point in time, even before COVID, someone decided to spend five, six, eight, ten 10 times their salary to move that person and pay them on a balance sheet model because they absolutely needed them there. And so is some of that going to change based on roles and level, et cetera? But I don't think you can get over that hurdle that those roles were dictated. You know, someone made a business decision that that role couldn't be found locally. Otherwise, I would have saved the money or B, I couldn't do it remote or some other way for all the roles. I also think, you know, you'll get things like commuters, you'll get work from anywhere and mobility is going to have a really interesting time now and an opportunity to help define policy, you know, compliance issues, commuter schedules. Like there's a, there's a whole world that comp, if you think about the HR function, the reason I said that is having been around all of HR, global mobility people are uniquely positioned. They've dealt with all this stuff that everyone else in the other departments are freaking out about. What if I move them there? What if they spend this much time there? How do I house them? How do I do all these, all this stuff? The other departments are freaking out and mobility is like, well, duh, this is the answer. Like, you know, so this is a really cool time, I think, for mobility to step in and, and maybe expand their footprint as well. So I think those two things to me say it's not going to be, you know, it's not going to go away. You know, I so I totally I totally agree. Massive opportunity for our industry with our skill sets to step up and say, I have the answers right now, whether it's COVID, whether it's Brexit, whether it's, you know, travel bans, whether it's, you know, work from anywhere, you know, and the tax and implications, immigration. I mean, whatever it is, we have the the, the we are so well prepared. To, to be just rock stars in our organization, have all the answers, have the supply chain, have the policies. Does our work change from the transactional moving people? Here's the requisition, get Jane Doe from point A to point B into what you're saying, kind of it sounds like policy, strategy. Here's the things to consider. Here's where if we have a choice to put people somewhere, people are choosing to go somewhere, can we be consultative about how we assist them getting there? Yeah, I even go as, you know, question I'd ask you being in, in that space. Um, that's good. My, the, uh, yeah, OCD part of me was really going to struggle with that. I don't even know whose office this is and her picture almost fell and that would have been, that would have been really upsetting. So, so my question to you would have been, would be, you know, with, with all these people wanting to work remote and work from anywhere, do companies get involved with helping people on self-directed moves, help them? And for a couple of reasons, one, just from a business why standpoint, they? why should they though? I'm going to so play I think, devil's advocate, right? It's your choice to move. Why should I help you? You're, yeah, this two, is for you. Two, this is two reasons. So two reasons in my mind, and you can shoot them down. One, um, you maintain the volume. Um, and so you, you know, if you had a hundred moves and now you're still going to move 50 on your own and 50 are self-directed, you can still negotiate a hundred moves. Um, and so you maintain a little bit of bargaining power and some volume with your vendors. The other okay. one to me is more important. If, if someone's moving and you guys know moving sucks, I know moving sucks. Um, okay. that person is going to be distracted if they self move, they don't know what they're doing. They don't have a resource. They're going to have to go out and price everything. Um, it becomes a huge issue. And so can you become a resource to really help them? And then all of a sudden you're into the, you know, you can dive into the comp pieces and the net to net comparisons and all this stuff and help them. So can you be a resource that makes that a much smoother transition? It's a benefit for the company. I think most people are are, are pretty good in general and, and would say, oh, the company's been really good to me. They helped me move. I don't know. To be honest, I'm so I'm in real, I'm in, I'm in mobility now and we're moving. I can't tell you how much I hated finding a mover. I, I can't even begin to tell you how I called and they're like, let us walk around your house. Let us figure it out. I would have loved to call up the company and be like, dude, who do we move with? Um, how does this work? Are they going to come pick my crap up? Where's it going to go? Like, and so the amount of time that I could then devote to work and how that would feel, I think that's a huge opportunity for mobility. And with a little bit, I would place that over the business side, but I think the business side is, Hey, you can make sure this happens. And with remote work anywhere, you know, 
you know, if I go to Italy, like someone doesn't know and they move themselves to Italy and they're in a sales role and they're, they start selling, the last thing you want a company is to find out that they're in a revenue generating role and you owe taxes in Italy. Like that, that, that is not an okay thing for the company. And now whose fault is that? Yeah. I mean, the risk goes way up when you cross the international yeah. border, right? Because I mean, you can get, I mean, you can even get sent home. I mean, there's all sorts of stuff that can come up, right? Well, you move to New York City, you got to pay tax while you're in New York City. Like there's just stuff, right? And I so there's I think knowing, you know, mobility people I have found tend to know more than they think they know, right? They're like, oh, I've only been in mobility five years. Well, if you drop them in with a lot of people, you know, that don't, do the international or a lot of domestic moves, they know a lot more than they think they know. I mean, just even knowing that there's stuff out there that needs to be known. I mean, just even knowing that if you go work in another state, you could be you could be incurring a tax liability and then being able to Google what the answer is on that versus just yeah. saying, hey, I'm going to hop in my trailer and go over here and chill in the in the in the Adirondacks or something like that, you know, just to see what happens. Well, for everybody on this call, I'm still in Massachusetts. You know, I've just been <laughs> taking a vacation there. If anyone asks, that's where I am. No. Yeah, Sean had generated revenue in two quarters, so don't even yeah. worry about where he's at right now. <laughs> I'm just kidding. That's a different problem. <laughs> I'm totally kidding. Yeah. That's, a, that's a major issue. No, this is interesting. I'd love to hear what people think out there. Um, let's see here. Anybody have any uh, – everybody? <laughs> Richard was just – Sean, I love the basket story. Yeah, oh. yeah, there we go. Elizabeth checking in. She's a self-starter. Let's see here. Got a bunch of people checking in here. Does, re does remote work. Does remote work tie in with the previous discussion? So we spend the day on the beach because we earn money whilst we sleep passive income. Yes. Yes. We talk about passive income, but this does not apply to most of you because most of you work for the man. So uh, so probably does not apply to, to most of you unless you got some good Bitcoin. Buy it now, by the way. Uh, Nashville, right on Broadway, working while hearing live music in the background, maybe eating fried pickles. Lizzie Beats, that would be hilarious. You just munching on some fried pickles. So the question is, what kind of, what's the right, she's got to answer now. What, I don't even know. What's the right type of beer pairing with fried pickles? What pairs with fried pickles? You know, me, I tend to lean this way anyway, but I'm an IPA guy with fried pickles. You know, just that kind of, yeah, I'm an IPA guy. Anybody else want to go? What do you think, Sean? What do you pair with? I'm a, por I'm a porter stout. I'm not a, I don't like the IPA. I just, I still am baffled by the story that, and I, you know, hops was really only used to, to make sure the beer stayed okay. It wasn't really even wanted. Um, it was a preservative. Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. yeah. All the way from, from England to India, right? India parallel. Yeah. Right? yeah. Like, and if it's going to go bad, you just put twice as much in. So, um, I mean, Hey, you know, Hey, it worked out, good. right? Oh. It worked for me. Let's see here. I mean, Let's see here. Sue, I love the beach, but not ideal for it. Give me a nice lounge share and umbrella in my pool. If only it weren't raining today. Yeah, but how productive are we sitting by the pool? You try to take that Zoom call. Your kids are running around. Somebody else's kids are running around. Even worse. Uh, yeah, Jana wants to be in Rio, though. Campos de Jardo, Jana, would be one of my top five. So I, I love Brazil. I just, Campos is out in the mountains, um, and they have great beer, and it's the chocolate capital, like that that nothing, nothing bad can happen if you're working remote there. <laughs> nothing bad can happen. Famous <laughs> last words. This yeah. is great. We've actually got some pickles. We've got some pickles pairings for you, Sean. Are <laughs> you ready? Richard, now this is a Brit. Pickles and Guinness. Yeah. I mean, Guinness goes with everything. To be honest with you. IPA, thank you. Rick Ferno. Yeah. Oh, so someone said it. This on on my thing, it showed up as anonymous, so they didn't want to claim that they were supporting you as an. No, IPA. no, Rick, Rick's here. Rick's okay. here. Sorry, Rick. Rick, I got All you. Right. I got you, Ricky. Ricky MC Ricky D here. Let's see. Liz Martin says, "I don't drink beer. Fuck it. Go big or go home." <laughs> beats, beats in the house. Liz doesn't drink that much. Vodka and pickles. Vodka and pickles. <laughs> Sounds like one of those pregnancy cravings. All right, uh, Ruby Hard Kombucha. Uh, did I say it right? Kombucha, Kombucha, Hard Kombucha. That's that's great. Let's see here. I'm not a productive when I work from vacation. Yeah. See, I mean, well, vacation's an interesting one. I think there's two. I think you know, I'm one of those that I I check mail if I'm gone for a week. Um, I'll check more mail early. I I want to have the comfort of knowing nothing's on fire, or or I have a client or a partner or somebody that's had an issue on Monday and they're going to stew all week. And then as the week goes on, I feel like, yeah, it's Thursday or Friday. They can wait till Monday. Um, but I know some people, they really need to take their vacation and just unplug. 
right? Um, and that to, I think there's just different schools of thought, and I hope companies are, you know, uh, open to people doing it different ways. Yeah, I mean, the company almost has to enforce a hard vacation because it's one. I mean, if you say, "Oh yeah, take a week off, no problem," and then you send people a bunch of emails, especially if you're the boss, right? You send people a bunch yeah. of emails. You know, I've even been guilty of that. I'll, I'll send emails. Listen, no need to respond now. You know, the assumption that you're reading it. Yeah. You know, and you know, we almost have to just we have to be respectful. I think. I think that um, comes back. The culture thing has come up several times, and that call. You know, how companies set comp culture right now is going to be really interesting um, with remote work and how you put teams together and do you allow people to have time to get together on teams and do things or, you know, how do you let them vacation? Um, how many days in the office? How many days from home? Are you flexible with that? There's just a lot of things now that I think are going to be interesting for companies to deal with on the company culture side. Yeah, it, it is interesting to see how people manage the, the hybrid environment. A lot of companies, what I'm seeing is they're just saying, we're going to let people work from home as much as they want. We're just asking them to kind of declare their schedule and when they're going to be in yeah. and when they're not, just so we can plan accordingly, communicate with us so we know what to do there. Um, yeah, I actually, just, with my my teams, I sent out a note and they, um, I had a uh, an Excel file that I sent them. Here's where I am all the time um, and some blockouts when I'm on the road, just, you know, because on the road, I'm happy to chat um, or what have you. But, you know, that communication, I think, is key when people are working remote. I don't work these days, you know, I'm going to be somewhere during this period of time and out. Um, our marketing team is really good at, you know, sending a team's note, hey, jumping out for an hour and a half, you know, if something's on fire, I'll be back. <laughs> yeah, it, you know, communication is, is I hate to say communication is key. I can't stand that, that, that cliche, but it is important to communicate. And if you are willing to communicate, it usually means that you're doing the right thing is you're, you're owning it. Well, it's not an Dar issue till it's an issue, right? So, um, yeah. Darlene, I've worked remotely since 2008, and I hope not to offend any managers. Go for it, Darlene. Don't apologize. Pull no punches. One thing I've noticed with new companies entering the remote world, some managers feel the workers are home are not quite, quote unquote, working, and then tend to micromanage every move, which in turn then makes a difficult work environment less productive. Yeah, again, I think it's the it's the rope, you know, for me, it's the amount of rope you give them and do the habit. And and I think having open dialogues with people on what type of person are you really? Um, you know, any answer is OK. Like it truly is OK. If you need me to talk to you every day, fine. Uh, if, if it's once a week, fine. Like, just yeah, be honest. I could I can envision like a new. So strength finders is something we did in our organization. But then there's also some that are like these. You know, they, they talk about not only what your strengths are, but then some will talk about what your motivations are. Some will talk about your personality and what you respond to. You know, it's almost like we need a new style of assessment to say, what's your leadership style or what's your how do you like to be led kind of a style? Because I'm that way, too. I mean, I I very much need someone to kind of sit with me while I work, like in a way. Like Tim, Tim's backstage pointing at me doing this emphatic thing because Tim knows. Like Tim will seriously get on a call with me. Like say we got an IT thing to like like get through or something. He'll work with me on the IT stuff. He's fantastic with that stuff. And it's like he'll just get with me and we'll just sit on a Zoom and, you know, we'll hash it out. And I just need to have that kind of like side-by-side -side experience and I don't know. I feel like there's other people like that. I had a boss that was like that. He just his his idea with work about working through a problem was everybody get in the conference room, war room it out. You know, five people in a conference room. I don't care. If we gotta stay here till eleven o'clock at night. We'll get a bottle of scotch. We'll order some pizza, and we're just gonna knock it out. We're just gonna sit with our laptops next to one another. Was it super productive? Didn't feel like it in the moment, but at the same time, it kept you focused on the on the thing at hand. Because you had that kind of like adjacent accountability yeah. thing. Oh, that's weird. Well, that's and I think you get a little bit of that feeling, which is hard to do remote, that everyone's in the boat paddling together. This is a team effort. We're all paddling the same direction. Might might be over the waterfall, but by God, we're going over together um, type of thing, which can be hard in a company to have everyone on the same page and feel like you're on a team. Yeah. Richard's asking, am I going mad here? Probably, Richard. What's your question? We've had corporate headquarters and we now have remote working. Will there be halfway sort of pop up offices where colleagues get together, then disperse after the job is done? 
Yeah, I think there's we you know WeWorks out there, and then we've talked about having a really you know smaller footprint in some of these. Our UK office actually is you know they're pretty dispersed, and so they get together when needed, you know, type of thing um, every so often. So I think there is going to be a half. I don't know if it's halfway. I don't know what percent it is. I think it's going to depend on type of roles and types of jobs and and how much they need to work together. But I think it's going to be a, some mix of thing. Which again, why it's going to be hard for HR, you know mobility coming up with policy, all that stuff's going to be just more complicated now because there isn't, you know, people aren't going to have six policies or four policies. They're just going to have our policy um, and or the layers of that policy in between almost to an individual level. All right. So this is a great segue. Everybody out there that says, I want to work in the mountains, all you mountains people and some of you beach people too, depending on where your beach is located. I'm talking <laughs> to you right now. Listen up. This is the other side of the coin. Where's my boy Jack Champell at? Tag Jack. Somebody tag Jack in the comments because he's got to hear this. This is the other side of the coin. He'll appreciate this, even though he doesn't agree with this. Um, what then happens from a compensation standpoint? Put your comp hat back on, right, Sean? Yeah. Now we have Rachel's up in the mountains and she's just you know knocking out grade A work all all day, but she lives in like nowhere, Tennessee. Sorry to anybody from Tennessee. Yeah. Um, sorry, Stacey's laughing. I think Stacey from Tennessee. Sorry, Stacey. Point is, though, what happens to her comp package? Yep. Right? She's no longer in Boston, where it's like super high cost of living. How do we pay yep. her? Does do we change her pay? I think this is super interesting. Um, and in, the, in the U.S., you have total rewards and the benefits change based on on you know the location. But I think there's a couple schools of thought. I think there's a really cool blend of cost of labor, so the old salary surveys and that stuff. Looking at it, so you go to Tennessee and you say cost of labor is lower. You need to then marry in you know what we would consider net to net location or the cola, those type of things. Marry that up to it and say, well, what is that? And do we gain share? Um, and, and that all sounds pretty simple, right? So if well, you no, no, that actually sounded really complicated. You threw a lot of things well, out there. Well, so, so you, you got cola, you, you, which is cost of living adjustment, yep. right? And you've got your cost of labor. So if you did a salary survey and so someone was making, you know, they were making $150,000 a year in New York City, they go to Tennessee and they have surveys there. And so they go to Knoxville and they say, hey, that job pays 120 here. You might then take her $150,000 and do a COLA adjustment, cost of living adjustment, and find out that, hey, she only needs to make $100,000. So they're gonna be happy, right? They're gonna have a better cost of living and you can show them that, the communication thing. If it's gonna be more there than the local salary, you're gonna have to figure that out. Um, where I think it gets really interesting is obviously the converse is difficult because companies are always thinking, well, hey, you know, Google just announced it. We'll pay by cost of living. Well, they're in the valley, right? So obviously it's harder to find expensive places. But if you said, well, we're going to pay based on cost of living adjustment and cost of labor. And someone says, I want to move from Knoxville to New York City. Right. Is the company going to pay more? The right. other part that I find from my recruitment and comp side that I find super interesting is if the company goes too cheap, letting, you know, saying, oh, she works in Tennessee, I can pay her very little. Now you have a national or global talent pool. And so yeah. all of a sudden someone jumps in and says, well, our strategy is we paid in New York City. I'm not going to change or save much money. I'm just going to get better talent for the same dollars. And so now I go recruit. And all of a sudden, you know, you know, I don't know where I'll get Stacy in trouble. Stacy's looking at a 40% raise for doing the same job for a new company. They don't care where she works. And so all this stuff is going to come to a head as companies try to figure out what's the right rate to pay, where do we gain share? If I go to a new state and there's tax compliance, who pays the tax compliance, you know, because I got to set up a new tax entity. I'm an, I'm a revenue generating employee. Like it gets really complicated really fast. And I'll keep coming back to a lot of that information cost of living, tax compliance based where you live, how you move, how many days you spend at the corporate office. That's all stuff that that mobility has dealt with for years. Whereas compensation is having, um, I don't know, this is a, a G-rated show, but they're having an oh shit moment right now. HR is kind of having an oh shit moment with like, I, what do you mean she wants to work in Tennessee? Well, she's making this. How do I call her and tell her she's taking a $20,000 pay cut? Is she? Is she not? We don't have anybody in Tennessee who's paying taxes there. How do we set that up? And she wants to move there. How do we do that? And mobility's like, no big deal. We got a tax firm, you know, you know, if they're moving internationally, don't need a visa, do need a visa. This is how it all works. We like for them, it's just like, this cola, is nothing. Doing the COLA cost of labor adjustment for us. We well, we would like them. that. We would like yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, for sure. But, for sure. but I think no, but all that is, stuff gets true. married and it's all stuff yeah. that really, other than the comp number, 
the base comp, which you already have mobility is like, this is same stuff, just in a different way. Yeah, this is, this is really interesting. So here's my, here's my take on this. I want you to tell me if I'm, if I'm crazy. Okay, Sean, perfectly acceptable answer. Most smart people say, it, okay, <laughs> here's, here's the deal. I think you're going to see parody. I think you're going to see parody and you know, gr increasing parody, not full parody, but you're going to see increasing parody or a uh, regression to the mean, whatever. I'm throwing around yeah. words that I don't know what they mean, but here's what, what I think is going to happen. I think you're seeing real estate prices increasing in traditionally lower cost of living areas, Raleigh, Dallas, I mm -hmm. mean, for name, name, them, right. You're seeing uh, cost of, um, you're seeing real estate prices go down in the, you know, um, in the, you know, in the, in the yeah. cities in the central business district kind of areas, right. The, the, the New York's right. And things like that. Um, cause, cause people are, are leaving the big cities where they have the big paychecks mm -hmm. and they're going out to the lower cost of living places and they're driving up the cost of these big houses. Cause now they need a home office for two people. Right. And a, and a gym and the home gym for their Peloton and all sorts of crazy stuff that they've accumulated <laughs> and their COVID puppy backyard and everything like that. Um, so you're seeing um, you're seeing them finding deals and finding kind of a um, little bit of, uh, you know, maybe I don't want to say arbitrage, but, you know, some great value in the suburbs. And they're taking their big city yep. paychecks with them. Um, that's also increasing the. Um, let's say the kind of the per capita income in those areas as yes. well, right? Which is increasing, you know, now 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 you're seeing, you know, restaurants charging more and and you're seeing kind of things start to creep up and and, and all that kind of stuff. So I I guess I guess it's really interesting to see do do we ever get to a place if work from anywhere or remote work becomes the primary and not the exception to the rule. Yeah. Do we see housing prices, cost of living, really normalizing a lot more and regressing to the mean. I think so. And I, I'd actually predict, I think there's going to be some cool, cool issues for companies. Do they go to a global pay scale? And so imagine the talent you can buy in some locations versus other locations on a global pay scale. You become the employer of choice. What is a global pay scale? Help me so if that. I pay, if I, you know, if I decide that I'm a, I'm a New York city company and I pay developers, you know, $125,000 a year, right? That's my median cost for a developer uh, pay, based payroll. What if I offer $125,000 around the globe? So imagine if, you know, there's a great talent pool in Africa or in Malaysia, Philippines, wow. like all of a sudden I'm the employer of choice, right? Imagine how disruptive that is. But if you're the company that used to be in New York, that's built into your cost structure. So there's some interesting, or, or do you not do that and try to do it based on the location? And um, I just think it's going to be super cool to your point. How do you get there? to normalizing towards the mean, that's going to be a really cool transition. Well, I think a couple of things might feed that, right? So if, you know, that global pay scale, so like how do, you know, why would we end up in that situation? Well, if this global talent shortage persists, right? Um, where, where we just continuously see not enough talent. And a lot of that, you know, here I'm sitting actually in the immigration office over here at, at Ellis Porter Immigration in Detroit, shout out to Ellis Porter for letting me squat in somebody's office while we're talking about kind of remote yeah. work and hybrid situations. Um, but, you know, I mean, there's only so many, you know, H1B visas. There's only so many people that yeah. come into the country. Now, what's interesting is we kind of almost have somewhat of a global pay scale when you look at immigration because they have to pay a prevailing wage. So you can get somebody from India, you can get somebody from Pakistan, you can get somebody from Vietnam. When they come over here, they pay the prevailing wage for that person here in the States. Now, if we can't get enough visas to bring all the people over that we need, we never have had enough. To, to, to fuel the growth that we need for these, these skilled workers. And we start paying those people from Vietnam and the Philippines and India based on U.S. I mean, golly, that could be. That could yeah, be even if you gain share, share, right? Even if you gain share that in the interim and you meet them halfway, you become what's, the employer. What's a gain share? What's gain Sorry, share? Sorry, so, you know, if you're going to save $50,000 a year, if it's $100,000 to hire someone here and 50000 in Vietnam, just make the math easy for me. I'm old. You basically so, say, yeah. I'll pay $75,000. And so the, that employees, you know, obviously they're stoked, um, you yeah, know, they're, and you become employer problems. of choice and you're saving, you're saving money on this side. And so, and that's how I see maybe even in the interim, some of the remote work, right. I'm moving to, I'm moving someone from New York city to Ames, Iowa. Um, I might, 
you know, show them the cost of living, the cost of labor and meet them in the middle. So now I don't want to lose them, right? The last thing you want to do is get them to move to Ames, Iowa, and then they move to somebody else who's the employer of choice on a global scale. But I can gain share with them potentially on some of these. But again, it's a lot of this, um, I'll come back to again, you know, aggregation of data that mobility has dealt with in the past, right? It's what are the tax consequences? That gets asked all the time. What's the cost of labor? What about home visits and coming back to the office and corporate visits, just like home visits, all stuff that mobility has dealt with, maybe not under the same title. So they're in a really kind of cool place to talk to, you know, to get a seat at the table and talk about, hey, I, I know what's going on. Like this isn't anything new. Um, it's new to you guys, but for us, this is like putting new skin on it. Yeah, man, this is so, so interesting. Um, the and comp side to me is the comp side to me is just I think it's super cool. You know, you get personalized rewards because basically if you had 15 employees in 15 different locations in 15 different states with 15 different benefits, people, um, you're going to end up with 15 different policies. I just, you just are. You know, what? you know, what's funny to me. I find this to be like super interesting and, and probably probably the most relevant information. But but really, we, we don't get nearly as many comments as when we're talking about the beach. <laughs> you know, and and then I get all this I get all this yeah. flack for like just talking about like the beach all the time and like playing around yeah. on the show all the time. But but when when people really engage, it's, it's really funny. Uh, we do have one question about this here. Uh, what about the local economy? If you're paying someone so much more than all the local offices or companies, I am not sure that this would be fair. There's local there's local guidelines around pay, right? So again, you know, these are things that mobility people have to deal with when you move people places. But you know, I, I guess it depends what's fair, you know, in some places, you know, a livable wage, you know, if you're paying above a livable wage, is that unfair? Um, you know, is it unfair if you offer 50% more than somebody else to get the best talent? You know, I don't know if it's unfair. That's a business decision. Yeah. Um, yeah. But is, is, not, paying people, is paying people too much unfair? That's, that's well, an and, and you know, that all sounds well, altruistic to do that. But obviously, if you run to management and say, you know what, I think I, I as Sean, go to our parent company and say, I think our our staffing mantra should be we pay 50% more than everybody else. They're going to they're going to find some cost savings right away with me. <laughs> so they'll get rid of me. You know, yeah. it's, there is a um, you, know, you still have to make money. Well, but I mean, in the business one, I mean, that gain share, you know, example that you no. gave, right? $100,000, you know, job here in the States, 50,000 job, you know, dollar job overseas. Well, the average is 75,000, still 50% more than they're making, but it's a 25% discount for the US based company. Um, is it is it unfair? That's interesting. I've never heard it asked the other way. This is uh, from from Zeta Hammond. And thank you for the question, Zeta. Um, you know, we look at we look at the US and we, we act like this doesn't happen every day here. There are people in New York City in the Bay Area who are making a million dollars a year. 10x a good salary. I mean, just the scales, the proportions that, you know, so there's, there's people out there that are, that are, that are doing these kinds of things already here in the United States. Um, I don't know that it, that changes things or, or not for us. So it's really fascinating. We're, we're, we could talk about this for, I mean, gosh, we all day. I could do all day. That's the problem. All day. So. All day. I know. Yeah. I know. We, we really, we really buried the lead on this one. That's my fault. <laughs> I, I own that. Rick Colonel, hey, don't knock me one most. Yeah. You guys talk about football. This is great. You're welcome. I'm not sure my name is not showing. Uh, it's Zeta Hamilton spelled Z-A-Y-D-A uh, okay. Hammond, not Hamilton, Hammond, sorry. Um, yeah, I don't know why either. It could be a privacy sign. All right, so here, you got a top five though, Sean? We're running out of time. I do. You guys asked. So I thought actually this kind of the, the top five things. So I've been in four plus short five weeks, five things I'm, I've, I've missed. Cause that, and actually that's been a big question. What it, people have asked, what, what are the things you miss? Um, so, you know, um, Number five was kind of the beverage storage. So part of the problem in traveling is there's a lot of good breweries and places, I guess wineries, I don't drink wine, but, um, and I'm very limited in the amount of space I can store and or in the fridge. So that, that creates a supply and demand issue per se. I can't bring much, you know, have to bring much home. So that was one. Um, so um, what do you, so what do you do? You do have a little fridge there. Do you start just drinking warm beer? Like just go real no, I have to. I have. A, I have a rotation system set up. Well, and and it's going to sound awful, but I have to have a you know relatively consistent consumption 
uh, model in place as well. You're, you're it just doesn't like, sound bad. I'm a, I'm a pretty avid triathlete. I try to burn it off. I don't want to sound like I'm just in the camper out at a campfire, um, you know, drinking beverages all the time. So I've been out playing in the woods some too, but the beverage piece was actually a uh, an issue in keeping things cold. That's great. I love it. I love um, it. All right. What about cooler? You don't have cooler with ice. You can get a cooler with ice, no? I, I could. The fridge is okay. So, um, you know, I have me, what's called the cinema let me ask pool. You one, yeah. Let me ask you one more. I'm sorry. Let me ask you one more yeah. about five. Best beer from this, we'll call it a trip, from this trip, from this project. What's so I, I'll give a shout out to Saucony Creek Brewing, Cutstown PA, Diesel Breath, um, Blonde Stout. I actually have been by there. They have what they call um, harvest hosts. So you can stop by these places, stay for free. Um, and the theory is you'll buy stuff from them and, and make up the difference since you stay for free, which they definitely do fine when I stop there. Um, I so stopped free there. Camp, free campground? Yeah. So, well, like it's, it, it's their parking lot. So you have to have your, you have to be self-contained, your own bathroom, your own water, your own electricity. And then they hope that you buy something. Parking lot. Yeah. It. No. So you can't do that. But I, I stop there every time I come through Pennsylvania um, and stay there. It is my favorite. It's one of my favorites. So that that one kind of hands down. So this is great. This is great. Uh, I like All Rob right. Zeitz, Economy of Ale. Um, nice. All right. So the, the second one is kind of a regulation size shower. So I have what's called a wet bath. It's probably two feet by two and a half feet, which is your bathroom and shower. So I'm kind of looking forward to actually a I'm regulation size right shower. Two, you said two feet by two and a half feet. That seems pretty much like my footprint. Y yeah, right maybe. Yeah, it's it's <laughs> it's about your footprint. So I'm I'm kind of looking, and of course the heater for hot water is um, pretty small. So that I'm kind of looking forward to uh, you know an actual size shower uh, type type of thing going on. Really, 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 really stretch out in there. Yeah, Kathy. Kathy um, says, "What about a wet bar?" <laughs> Of course she would. She would. That's what Kathy would want. So, yeah. Um, and number three. Uh, laundry, actually. So I actually, my first big mistake here is I spent the first weekend doing the Appalachian Trail in Shenandoah National Park. We took a couple days, knocked out the, Shen the Appalachian Trail in the park. And um, um, I tried to hang dry, went out for the next morning, and I tried to hang dry my clothes from the weekend in my camper. Um which again, it's a hundred square feet. So when you hang dry your workout clothes that you spent 24 hours in um, and not having laundry, there was no coming there. It took several days to come back from that error. So I think having laundry on hand would be uh, that, I, that I'd, I'd love. Um, Some days to come back from yeah. that error. That means it stank for a yeah. while. N uh, number yeah. two. Uh, an oven. So I don't have an oven and I make a lot of I didn't realize how much stuff I actually cooked um, with an oven or an air fryer. So I have two stove top burners. That, that's kind of the extent of my uh, uh, piece. So actually just being able to make like a pizza will be super cool. Um, so I'm kind of stoked about just having an oven and just spend all the stuff you kind of use every so often. Do you have a grill? I do have a grill, but um, it's outside. And I'm not going to lie, Tampa and Tuscaloosa had record highs for there for their summer heat in August. And so I, I'm not going to lie. I'm from the North. I wanted nothing to do with cooking out at 96 and 95% humidity. Well, over a grill. Anything, you probably don't yeah. want anything to do with baking in it either, yeah. to be honest with you. Um, and then the last one is just high speed internet. Like I'm telling you, it's, it's been, um, the people I've worked with for the most part have been really good about, you know, or making fun of me which probably is also entertaining for them. Um, when, when my face freezes or anything happens, Stacy was great. Yeah. My face froze. Uh, Stacy was great right before this. So just high speed access and not having to, you know, you take it for granted at home in general, right? You go pop on, I've got to make sure I've got, I've got a hotspot plus my phone set up. So if one goes out, I got the other so that the mechanics of the access and setting up are, are a big deal. I haven't, I don't have enough bandwidth really to stream in general. So that's been kind of interesting too. So I don't know if there's anything new on Netflix or Hulu, but I've seen nothing. Um, no. Well, you, you're doing, you're doing a great job streaming, streaming today no. here. Uh, Richard's giving you some pointers. Uh, we only drink warm beer in Britain, Ben, you'll see that soon. We're known for that. Well, Is that true though? I thought, I thought that was untrue. One, I, I don't think it's true. one. I don't think it's true. And secondly, I don't think anyone says the Brits are the uh, pinnacle of cuisine. So I'm not a hundred percent sure. And I love, you know, we've got a flat in London, so I'd have to find out what his club is. That'd be the important thing. Which club is his? 
So uh, I think there's some club talk in here before. Yeah. And there was something about uh, them coming in second. Uh, Man City. Yeah, he's a Man City supporter, it sounds like. Uh, anyway, what are you going to do? Um, this is great, Sean. I really, really, really appreciate you coming to us from the road there, from the, the, the Air Inc. virtual uh, tour bus uh, extraordinaire. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this is great. Um, Sean, do you want to leave us with a final thought? I mean, my, my big thing is, you know, not coming from mobility. I think it's a really cool time for people to kind of, you know, call it Prairie Dog or whatever you want to call it in the company, but to kind of poke your head up and say, hey, this stuff is not new for us. I mean, and I have found mobility people are are typically pretty shy about their skill set, which in other industries is not the case. Um, they really know a lot about this stuff and it might be direct, but it's a hell of a lot more than other people in the organization know what's going on and it all translates pretty well. So I think it's a really cool opportunity um, for people to do that. And, you know, um, the other piece would be just, you know, if you're thinking about doing a trip, it, it's, um, it, it, it's, it's pretty fun. You know, I'm, I, I've been digging it, you know, this, the, the remote work, you know, having been a remote worker and trying to be more remoter, if that's a thing. Um, more, more remoter. Yeah. More remoter. Yeah, do it now. Do it now before yeah. you get that memo saying October 1st, return to office, yeah. you know, hard, hard and fast because you're going to look back like this is your opportunity. So yeah. that's great. I love I love the uh, advice uh, for mobility to lean into the times right now because this really is our time, I think. So uh, so way to, way to put a kind of a silver lining on it to Sean. Thank you so much. This is great. Everybody out there who was watching today, the comments were fantastic. The questions were great. I appreciated all of your dreams of beach and mountainside working. This was fantastic. Thank you for all getting involved. Hit that like button. Hit that green applause button for Sean. He certainly deserves it. This was a lot of fun. I couldn't have done it without all of you. And I definitely couldn't have done it without Sean. So thank you, Sean, for being here today. Really yeah, thanks for having me. This was great. Take care, everybody. Tomorrow, Lisa Beaver from Blue Blue Origin. Is that a thing? Yeah, Blue Origin. That's the one with the <laughs> spaceship. Yeah. Lisa Beaver from Blue Origin, corporate mobility person over there. She's going to talk about what does relocation mean when you're putting people in space. I don't know. We'll find out tomorrow. It's Take like care, the everybody. opposite. <laughs>